Well, hi, everybody. This is Steve Tartar in another edition of Tartar Sauce. And with me today, all the way from Western Illinois University, the director of the Rural Affairs Institute, Chris Merritt. Chris, welcome. Thank you very to much. To our uh, palatial studio here in the Journal Star, Peoria <laughs> Journal Star. Uh, Chris, you've been heading up a, explain to people, your, the, it's sort of self-explanatory, the Rural Affairs Institute. Um, how do you explain that to people? What, what do you guys do? Uh, so thumbnail sketch, uh, we are a university-based uh, research, outreach, teaching, and policy development center, and uh, our primary audience and clientele are uh, anybody who lives in a rural community in Illinois. Um, you know, one of the great questions is, how do we define rural? Uh, great question. It changes. Uh, it changes, and it you know, really depends on the agency you're talking to. The USDA has like about 19 different definitions depending on the grant program, but you know, a very quick definition would be um, sort of 66 downstate non-metropolitan counties uh, defined in 2003 by the Office of Management, Federal Office of Management and Budget. Uh, really about... One and a half, 1.8 million people in the state uh, are our primary clientele, so, you know, 66 counties. Um, but we're very much interested in, I guess quite simply, trying to improve the quality of life in rural places. And, you know, we hear that, Chris, and, you know, you and I got to know each other when you held an annual uh, symposium, or uh, you probably have another word for it, but a, a fascinating uh, annual event that you hold now in Springfield, but it has been in Peoria. Um, where you have speakers from all over the country, many from Illinois, but basically talking about success stories, things that didn't work, things that did work for small towns. That's right. Because let's face it, um, you don't have to, you know, be a heavy reader or a follower of, uh, you know, websites to know the rural America has taken a, a heck of a hit. That's in, right. In well, since what World War II. Absolutely. And even before that, uh, I'm not so sure. Well, in some instances, it is a hit. Uh, we know that, uh, and many people don't actually th sort of think about this, but there's many counties, even in the state of Illinois, uh, whose population peaked over 100 years ago. Really? So uh, Livingston County, uh, Hancock County, you know, in and around West Central Illinois. And, um, and I don't think people really paid attention to it until very recently. These right. people sort of uh, were uh, plugging along. Uh, they noticed their small towns were getting sort of uh, gradually slower, uh, smaller and smaller. But, you know, farms were, for the most part, prosperous. I mean, you know, where's the farm crisis and commodity prices ebb and flow? But mm -hmm. um, uh, it is absolutely true that for many counties, they've really had an, sort of inexorable decade-by-decade decade population loss. And um, state, and in particular federal, rural development policy has really just been about farm policy with very little right. attention paid to the communities, mm -hmm. which are really essential to the support of agriculture. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we argue is that uh, rural communities depend on farmers, but rural farmers depend on their communities. And and, right. and unfortunately, uh, for much of the 20th century, in fact, for all of the 20th century, the primary emphasis has been on agricultural productivity, which is great. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We want farmers to be profitable, productive, accessing new markets, global markets. But at the same time, uh, as we've seen the number of farmers decline and the average farm size increase uh, because of the mechanization of agriculture, uh, we've actually seen the, the very important uh, uh, supporting rural communities decline as well. You know, fewer farmers, fewer clients for hardware stores, hospitals, and so forth. And that's, it's really been, as the number of farmers has declined, rural communities have also declined. And now, of course, you hear, and this is a relatively recent, uh, I guess, uh, phenomenon, that retail in general, uh, that mortar, brick and mortar retail is uh, floundering or having, depending on how uh, you know, lurid you want to make the story, uh, right. malls are dying, uh, uh, you know, people, examples are being cited here and there, and, you know, we know Sears is in trouble, and all these long-standing chains um, are, are either cutting back or, or mm -hmm. not what they were. 
And of course, this has a ripple down effect into the small town too, doesn't it? I mean, you, you're you're having a hard time. Walmarting of America that's certainly right. hit that, small town. America. That's absolutely true. Uh, we can even talk about the dollar generaling of uh, rural America as well. That uh, a more recent phenomenon. A very much more recent <clears throat> phenomenon. But you know what I would say is this: uh, uh, people are talking about the retail apocalypse, but I would say that it, it has in fact had a disproportionate impact in rural America uh, because when J.C. Penney is in retrenchment, when Sears and Kmart are in retrenchment, uh, the first places they look to shut down stores or to scale back services is in rural communities. And so sure. in our area, for example, you know, Canton and Macomb, they lost their Kmarts, their JCPenney's, uh, their Sears, uh, long before and you know, they're gone. And while they, they are still functioning to a certain extent in suburban Peoria, Chicago, and so forth. So that retail apocalypse it's absolutely real, but again, it has a disproportionate impact in rural. Now, your your um, institute is is sort of uh, you you explained what it does. Um, you, so you have a lot of facts and figures about you know, as you just sort of mentioned. Some of these population declines are, are century old, um, but you have all kinds of inf information about grants and things that communities can do. Um, are you optimistic? Are you, are you You've been at the, the helm here, what, 12 years? <laughs> that's right, that's um, right. Are you, are you worn down yet? I mean, have, we, have we hammered you enough with well, the reality? Yeah, so, you know, I feel like uh, my colleagues and I, we are, we're in the trenches, and so uh, we often talk about community and economic development as a process, which is to say uh, you can never sort of rest on your most recent success story, right? So mm -hmm. um, we've been talking about the gloom and doom. Uh, but, you know, as I've said, population decline has been around for 100 years. And so uh, despite that gloom and doom, many of these rural communities are still there, right. uh, which is to say uh, there's great value and there is uh, great leadership in rural communities. Who knew, right? I mean, this is so... so while we absolutely want to pay attention to the gloom and doom, the negative things that are going on, uh, we want to be aware of sort of the needs of rural communities. We also want to emphasize the assets. And so every small town, whether it knows it or not, uh, it's, and it, it's sort of, uh, I'm, I'm reinvigorated every time we go into a new community because there's a new set of leaders who didn't know they were leaders, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we go into a community and we sort of uh, challenge them. And, and, and in fact, we're, we are invited in by these communities. Um, my colleague, uh, Giselle Ham, who's really great at this, uh, she'll ask these communities, you know, three questions. Where are you now? Where do you want to be? And how do you get there? And we really put the onus on the rural communities to figure out, along with some input from us, what does the future look like? Mm -hmm. With their own v vision for what that future looks like. And uh, we've been just talking about uh, very recently, we were in Strasbourg, uh, Illinois, down sort of south of Decatur. And, um, you know, they had experienced many... Uh, uh, years of decline and sort of stagnation, and we worked with them. Uh, it's a town of how many? Uh, it's between 500 and 1,000, so okay. pretty small, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, small town America. And uh, they were, uh, you know, feeling sort of sad about the fact that they didn't even have a restaurant, they didn't have any sort of social space where you could go, you know, was that you were either at work or at home or at school, you know, where do you go to, uh, so very small and, and really lacking amenities. And with our sort of assistance, they kind of plug, plunged ahead and said, well, maybe we need a tax increment financing district to sort of redo some of our downtown. They were able to recruit a convenience store and a subway gas station um, they've started a new residential subdivision. Uh, so some big community transforming events along with some small festivals. And s so a spectrum of events over a 10-year period. So this is the other challenge, right? right. Uh, community and economic development is – it's not a sprint. It's, it's a marathon and often a grueling marathon. But <laughs> with the right people in place, the right community leaders, uh, it's really surprising – and positively surprising what a small town can do. Do you find, because I know your reach is, well, you, you, the Illinois Institute, you, you're, you're connected all over the country. You, I know uh, your annual event, you have speakers from everywhere from coast to coast. And do you find, is there a um, sort of seething 
you know, I don't want to say renaissance because that's either an inappropriate word or overly optimistic. But you 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 hear and and the the success stories are always cited. Right. You you guys find them. Somebody from North Carolina comes in and talks about what this town did. Is that is in, becoming increasingly more difficult, or is it just the way the flow of things, as you said, the, the getting those people together and right getting them working? Yeah. So. Um Again, we talk about needs-based development versus asset-based development. So, you know, uh, some uh, researchers out of uh, Northwestern University years ago talked about A, B, C, D, asset-based community development. Uh, so we want to be realistic about the challenges, right? So people talk about the opioid uh, you know, crisis affecting, in many ways, rural America disproportionately. Right. Again, because rural areas, and people might not think about this, people think about uh, rural areas as agriculture, but um, interestingly, rural areas are still, even though the absolute numbers are smaller, rural areas disproportionately rely on manufacturing jobs. And so a lot of these jobs, manual labor or manufacturing jobs where uh, there's a lot of work-related injuries, this is one of the reasons why the opioid ep uh, uh, epidemic is affecting rural areas disproportionately. We don't want to downplay the needs in rural areas, but we can't just be about, oh, woe is me. We need to be thinking about positive things and, and celebrating our success stories. So I made a short story long there. The point is- <laughs> That's that, what podcasts are for. Very, very good. Well, thank goodness <laughs> for editing, right? Uh, so the, so the, the point is that you know, for every negative story that we can easily find, uh, we can uh, we can in fact find one or more positive stories, right? So, you know, news and media I think in many ways accentuates the negative, and it's 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 sometimes harder to find the success stories, but they're there. And so we think that part of our job is not not always just to be pointing out the problems, but to be finding solutions. You know, one of the things, and and I know this is just a narrow part of the small town formula, whatever, but you know, we've done stories, and, and maybe that's the, the way I'm looking at it from the standpoint of going to a community and talking to different people and then writing up a, a little story that may or may not reflect, you know, the real story because, uh, you know, a one-day wonder is, is not the necessarily the, as you said, it's a marathon. But one of the things that strikes me when I've gone to some of these towns around central Illinois, which is basically the area I've, I've become slightly familiar with, um, is... It's got to be a real challenge to get people out there because if you're an antique store and, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, more power to you for, for, for doing that and setting that up in your town and maybe the cost is low and, and you can do everything yourself, but you still need customers. And you've already talked about the decline in population of the local people. So who's coming through there and, and you, how do you get folks to – say, come from Peoria or Bloomington or Pekin or wherever the, the, the larger population is, to visit these towns? That's right. So uh, excellent question. I, of course, the Spoon River Drive is a, right. is a, a two weekend a year, yeah. but that's, you know, what about the other 50 weekends, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we know that there are strategies like this. Um, and I don't think there's an easy answer here. Uh, part of uh, the solution, however, is, uh, you know, people are talking about uh, not just bringing uh, customers in from afar, uh, but also, you know, how do we bring new businesses in? And so there's a couple of, of sort of innovative strategies people are talking about. Um, you know, th there's this uh, sort of trend about, uh, you know, hiking in hops, right? So microbreweries mm -hmm. and outdoor activities, and, and people are highlighting the fact that well, you know, um, I think it's called Tangled Roots uh, a Craft Brewery. I think it's in Ottawa, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, go, go to Starved uh, uh, Rock uh, Park in the afternoon. Um, then you can go to uh, the craft brewery for, uh, to quench your thirst. Or mm -hmm. if you're down by the Petersburg area, uh, New Sa uh, Salem uh, State Park there, there's a, a new brew pub down there. So it I think we have to talk about creative marketing for many of these. Mm -hmm. There sort of needs to be a destination uh, created in the minds of people who might be willing to take a day out of their busy schedule to, to venture out into rural Illinois. Uh, I'm not originally from West Central Illinois, and I will say this. Uh, Where are you from? Uh, I'm originally from Canada. 
Okay. Yeah. So good objectivity here. Right, right. eyes. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I'm so old that uh, <laughs> I grew up with WLS uh, Chicago uh, uh, radio back when AM played uh, played music, and so you know, the big eighty nine. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, right. John Record Landecker <laughs> and Boogie Check and all that. So. Uh, that was when it was good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. Uh, so it, you know, at nighttime, that AM signal would boom uh, north um, uh, up Lake Michigan, and um, but so I, I, I came to uh, rural downstate Illinois, thinking, you know, I'm going to stay here for two or three years. And uh, my wife and I, we, we we came here in 1995, and. Uh, it's it's kind of dangerous moving into a place that's as actually as pleasant. So there's actually, uh, you know, I'm I'm in downstate Illinois be, by choice, and and I, I think there's you know it's a beautiful uh, talk about a subtle beauty, uh, but it's nonetheless a beautiful landscape. I enjoy the agricultural landscape. The, you know, hardworking people. There's a great there's a great workforce uh, in yeah. downstate Illinois. There's a lot to be said about it, and. You know, part of my frustration, I think, is there's a, a little bit of an inferiority complex. I think oh. that that many yeah. rural pla- rural places have. That I, well, I've noticed that in uh, Peoria, because uh, you know, I came here from Boston to Bradley, stayed here, liked it, uh, raised a family, and and remain here uh, by choice, like mm-hmm. you. I've learned to change my view of cornfields and flatland, sort of being at one time nothing or. Right. A plainness to, oh, that's as good as New England, you know, I mean, in its own way. Right. Uh, and I think people have to kind of adapt that. But there is that, well, you know, what are you doing here? Like, you have to explain yourself. Exactly. You know, and, right. and it's, well, you know, I, I kind of like it. Well, you like it, you know. You, right. You know, give me a reason why you like it here. And if you have that kind of attitude, and, and I'm sure people who, who maybe have just seen things dry up right. in the exactly. town right. and, and feel frustrated, uh, I can understand that. Um, I have to, you know, throw this out, and and because I think maybe sometimes, and you may have other examples, better examples, but the little town of Wyoming mm-hmm. in Illinois, not the state, um, Stark County, as you said, uh, reached its peak a hundred years ago. Um, very small town, but it has a trail. Mm-hmm. Um, it has a driver's license bureau, which, mm-hmm. if you've been to the one and you've had to wait in line, go on up to Wyoming. I bet they don't have a line up there. Uh, a great coffee shop, <laughs> right. which is relatively new. It was again, I didn't learn all this, but people tell you. And then there's a little business district which mm-hmm. has some things. Um, so you find things. I mean, but the, the, and I, I I posed this to to some of the people there when I was doing a story was. So you got all this, but now you just need more customers. Exactly. You know, right? And, and you know, you just people need to get out there a little mm-hmm. bit and and uh, explore uh, the area. And I guess that's. That's, a, a, as you say, a marketing thing. But you, you've probably found other towns that maybe have things you wouldn't expect uh, that, that are right under our nose. Uh, that's right. Well, so, and um, maybe I'm sort of geeking out on renewable energy here, but I mean, I, I just think that in the, in the Tiscawa area up, well, actually near Stark County, I mean, some people are not attracted to the to the wind uh, turbine landscape. But I mean, you know, from my perspective, there's something interesting about that and mm-hmm. the extent to which uh, downstate Illinois is really a resource-based economy, whether it's, uh, you know, far downstate, it's coal extraction to, you know, still a little bit of coal extraction, uh, or whether it's agriculture, uh, or whether it's renewable energy, whether it, uh, in the area of wind and, uh, of course, also ethanol production. And so, you know, and Part of it, I guess, is maybe uh, downstate rural Illinois needs to do a better job of marketing itself. It's a, it's an interesting landscape. And by the way, my wife is from uh, central Massachusetts. And so uh, she also, uh, you know, me from Canada, sh- she from New England, uh, we really just, uh, you know, we raised our family here. We just really love downstate Illinois. So there's a lot to offer. Um, you know, there's a local foods movement uh, that's uh, very active in many places, like in and around Galesburg and Monmouth and Macomb. Mm-hmm. Um, there's great rails to trail cycling, uh, whether it's you know from Peoria out to Princeville. There's craft brewing. Um, you know, so it turns out. Um, if you just sort of scratch the surface, there's a lot that can be done, and, and I think there's just a, a challenge of marketing uh, what people, how people perceive uh, the uh, 
sort of the diversity of, of downstate and rural Illinois. I mean, there's actually an African foods uh, market uh, in uh, mm. Rushville, Illinois, which caters really? to the immigrant uh, uh, workforce that works in and around uh, Beardstown and so forth. So, well, that you now that's an interesting point because one of the things I, I've noticed when when I was covering uh, agriculture, which means rural uh, affairs, as you, as you mentioned. Was the absence of minorities, right? You know, in the small towns, right. and I'm not blaming these towns. Obviously, they, did, you know, it's just, you know, one could say the historical forces and economic forces, but that's that would seem to be a possible solution. It's absolutely yeah to it, the problem of it's absolutely you know, uh, it's absolutely a solution, a controversial solution in the eyes of many. But uh, oh sure, but there's uh, there's all kinds of census data that shows that uh, many communities in uh, Nebraska, Iowa, um, the Dakotas, Minnesota, many of those rural communities whose population was, r- rural population was relatively stable during the 90s, aughts, and you know, through the, the 2000 teens, that population was stabilized as a result of in-migration of foreign labor. Oh. So, uh, if, and there are many people in those communities who, in fact, uh, you know, would call for building the wall and and uh, you, know, you know keeping all that migrant labor out, but they don't understand that their uh, their local economy uh, was bolstered and sustained by the influx of these people who are paying taxes, are uh, are, are patronizing local stores, and in fact, one of the best rural development policies. And this is just Chris talking. Uh, one of the best rural development policies would be um, a, a better uh, uh, immigration policy that would uh, would not be so hesitant about uh, rural in-migration. It would just change the, uh, I think, the economic landscape of our of our rural communities. And we already see it to a certain extent, um, but I think it could be made a lot better uh, in terms of um, you know bolstering the workforce. You know, hardworking immigrant labor uh, really sustains many rural rural communities, and I, it should be, it would be, I think, healthier for these rural uh, uh, communities if they could be less furtive, if they could be more obvious, if they had you know legal documents, mm-hmm. uh, they would be more forthright in investing in the community if they weren't so fearful of being um, of being um, you know s- sent back to wherever they came from. Well, and and you know the other side of that is in many of these towns, and and you know we could tick them off. The the the, the downtown has probably got this empty store, that empty store, mm-hmm. ready for a restaurant if somebody wanted mm-hmm. to do an ethnic restaurant, or, and it might draw people, Absolutely. you know, from all over. But anyway, we we can't um, uh, because we're in the state of Illinois, and we know the problems of budget. Um, sort of discount the fact that uh, your department's taken a hit. You're located at Western Illinois University, which unfortunately is uh, on the uh, you know, receiving end of lots of uh, cutbacks of the state of Illinois. Uh, explain how you've uh, had to cope with that at the Institute. Right. Uh, so state budget impasse uh, really hit us hard, hit the university hard. I, I will say uh, there's been remarkable resilience uh, by uh, Western and the other uh, public institutions in this state, but there has absolutely been some collateral damage, I would call this. Mm-hmm. Uh, we lost uh, nine in- employees over about an 18-month period. And how many do you have normally? Um, we had been as high as 45 people. Many of those are grant-funded, federal grants, for example. Uh, but we lost uh, nine positions uh, that had uh, state-appropriated support underneath mm-hmm. them. Um so we've really had to rethink um, how we do business, if you will. And uh, <laughs> when we were downsized, we were right in the middle of actually expanding three programs. So we, mm. we were starting a new master's degree in community and economic development. Um, and we opened up a second small business development center on the WIU Quad Cities campus. We opened up an international trade center on the uh, Moline campus of WIU. So... Uh, instead of sort of retreating and curling up in the fetal position as a result of this hit, which is we, so tempting. Uh, well, I was tempted uh, many. Uh, in fact, I may have a couple of days being in a semi-fetal position. But uh, at the uh, at the end of the day, you know, we sort of uh, rose up and uh, and met that challenge head on. But we are still 
we are still feeling the lingering effects of of uh, trying to deliver the same amount of programming uh, with about a third fewer people. If somebody is listening to this podcast, watching this podcast, um, and they may be, oh, no, of town situation that they'd like to find out more, what should they do? Go to your website? Absolutely. Call you up? Or yeah, what? the website uh, would be uh, the easiest. Uh, it's uh, www.iira.org. Uh, you Illinois can, Institute of Rural Affairs. Illinois Institute for mm-hmm. Rural Affairs. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, certainly Google us. Uh, we'll sh- we'll show up. Right. Um, or email me um, c d hyphen merit at wiu dot edu. Um, you give you, you know, my direct line is uh, area code three zero nine two nine eight two two eight one. But you know, simple. Google us. Find an email. Email. We'd love we love to hear from communities because we can. In every instance, we will find some solution to some of the challenges that you're confronting. So we we really, you've seen them all. We've probably. seen so so many of them, and and you know you know people will talk about um, you know little towns fading off into oblivion, but we are firm believers that there can always there's always a solution uh, to the to the rural community challenges, and we love rural communities. We want to see them thrive. Well, that's great. Well. Chris, Chris Merritt's been our guest. Um, that kind of attitude, that kind of, uh, well, resilience, whatever, I mean, I think that's what you see. I mean, it's so easy to drive through a town you've never been to before, whip through it on your way to somewhere else and go, wow, this place is really uh, empty or whatever your quick uh, once over is. And yet behind those buildings and, you know, as you said, is a, is a population of people that are, they're 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 getting either working on it or w- want to work on it. Absolutely, yeah. they just it's sometimes it's just a a change of uh, a, a, a changed mental perspective, if you will. Just a it's it may not be so much of, as a crisis of economics as a, it's a crisis of imagination. We've always done mm. things the same way for fifty years. Maybe if we just tried a new idea, and and uh, it's surprising well, that's how that's the hardest happens. thing. It, it, I'll those tell new you, ideas. It, those new, I know we get we get entrenched, we get in a rut. Uh, farmers know that for sure. You get in a rut, but you know it's surprising. People people are creative. It just mm-hmm. is amazing to me. Well, very good. Well, we thank you for uh, coming on Tartar Sauce and Matt Dayhoff at the controls, making it possible. You come back. We'll hopefully you. You'll keep fighting the good fight here in uh, downstate Illinois, and uh, we look to to help more of the, uh, the rural population out there. Thanks again, folks.